I'm Mark Lynn Kennedy, and this is how you sell without selling out. Rogers That. Hi, everybody. I'm Rogers Healy, the host of Rogers That, a podcast dedicated to selling without selling out. And today we have a great friend of mine, someone that embodies passion and excitement, entertainment, storytelling. He's like a modern day Walt Disney, and his job every day is to make sure you walk away with a different experience. He is the founder of In Your Face Productions. He's an executive producer of multiple TV shows. He's done everything from Vegas to Los Angeles to the great city of Dallas, Texas. He played football at my alma mater, SMU, and that's actually how I met him a few years back. He was on the field doing a coin toss with another musician that I just love and adore, which we'll get there later. And I became fascinated with the guy. And I went up to him and introduced myself and said, hey, Mark Lynn Kennedy, you don't know me, but I want to be your friend. And fun fact, the first time I had lunch with him, I broke down crying because he was the first person I told that my wife and I were having a baby. And so he'll always mean something special to me. But today he's going to share his story of being a unique brander, a storyteller, and someone that just finds a lot of love and everything that he does. So Marklin, thanks for being here today. Rogers, you're awesome, man. When I, I went to your website, I kept seeing your podcast and it said, sign up if you want to come on the show. And I put on there my name and they go, for what reason? I go, because Rogers is awesome and he has great hair. Well, here we are. See, the, the hair that, is here. And, and, and you got the hair. This is about telling people how awesome uh, you are. And, you know, I, I kind of tried to sum it up in a quick intro, but you're such a unique guy, and I, I think that when people meet you, they probably are, it's like me, they're confused, like, what was that? Yeah. What, in, in a great way, it's like, it's overwhelming, where then I get to hear your story, and I remember we had lunch, and I was sitting there, I was like, oh my God, this is like, I feel like I'm talking to myself, where you're a doer, and you're an achiever, and you find stuff that excites you, and you figure it out, and you get to a point where maybe it exhausts you, or you get bored, and you move on to the next, but what made Marklin, which is even a unique name in itself, Marklin? My parents made it up when I was born. Oh, literally I, made the name up. Made it up. And oh. I used to, have, I've always had a joke and I never knew why people laughed, but they would go, what kind of name is that? And I'd go, oh, my parents were alcoholics. Oh. And they weren't, but it would just get a reaction <laughs> oh, and people would just start laughing. And I go, I guess that makes sense to somebody why I'm saying it. So through all the years, my name has been butchered from everything, margarita, martini, mark, any of that different stuff. So whenever uh, we had my daughter, I wanted to fill out the birth certificate with a bunch of different names. I just thought it was boring on a driver's license because through club business, you'd always look and there'd be three names. And so I wanted to fill a bunch of different spaces. And we ended up naming her Barbecue because it was one of my Let's, favorite foods. And you, you heard that correctly, everyone. And yes. this, again, this is just a lead in to one of the most unique individuals <laughs> you'll ever meet. And let me just sidestep it by telling you, Marklin has the most gorgeous kids on planet Earth. So your daughter's name again? Barbecue. 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 Her name is Alexa Lillian Barbecue Kennedy. And we wanted barbecue. And by the way, it's spelled out. It's spelled out. It's B-A-R-B-E-Q-U-E. So mm. it's not the C. Mm. We didn't go the normal route. Yeah, we had to uh, throw some... Some, some some flash in which there. there might not be a normal route of naming a human barbecue so barbecue. either way you own the space well and every time her birthday would come up uh fox out of vegas would always have the barbecue weather forecast barbecue's birthday they like the town embraced it and she became this little thing where everybody would send her t-shirts and barbecue sauce and stickers mm. and all of these things which is why you named your son john right john we just wanted him to go away well we let the girl no name no the no boy. which the boy is named queso of course and again <laughs> ladies and gentlemen here we are minute three into the most entertaining podcast you're ever going to listen to a daughter named barbecue and a son named queso, queso. because when you have fake alcoholic parents named you marklin <laughs> you feel like you have to carry this on to the next generation and as someone named rogers where i've had richards See? robert and is that your first name or your last name how many of them are you you know every yearbook in the world spelled my name incorrectly but you've embraced it you know, and I think that you were just kind of born with a unique ability to go and be a storyteller, you know, and I think that's why I was excited to have you on here. And, you know, you're talking about your daughter and your wife and your son, these things that mean the most to you now. But what got you to the point where, you know, you kind of pivoted throughout life to become a, a business icon, an entrepreneur, but someone who has proved to just embrace things that other people maybe don't understand, but you right. know that it's the right, right thing for you. What was it like? What was childhood like? What was it like going to college and moving to L.A. and doing the acting thing, reality TV? What, what was the evolution? Growing up, I went to high school in Plano, uh, and my father was an actor, but they were in the car business. So I grew up in the car business, 
And they had dealerships in the Southwest. We were out of Houston, so they were partnered up with the Gilmans and Dad worked with them forever. We had a dealership in, in Oklahoma. And so I grew up with my dad with the sales mentality. So came to SMU, played football, uh, had made uh, an all-Southwest conference team on the uh, newcomers team and was getting looked at by the Raiders and the Cowboys and was very excited because it was 91 and that was when strike was happening and everything and I mean Rudy could have ended up playing oh, you yeah. know, it's one of the teams and I was also playing rugby and I'd had a motorcycle wreck a month after I graduated I was on the back of a bike a friend was driving he was supposed to go down a little alley in a circle and he got out on two it was Royal Lane <clears throat> and within a block and a half he had a median head on going 70 mm. and I didn't have a shirt shoes or helmet and got thrown 166 feet down the concrete just ass over tea kettle Everything uh, my, on the left side of my body broke foot, all these things. So doors closed, but optimistically I knew that other doors were, hopefully let's figure out what's on the other side of it. My dad was out in L.A. at the time. Most people, by the way, at that stage would have probably taken a different path and taken a, a, dark, a darker yeah. path, but you learned how to pivot pretty quickly, literally, because you had no other option. I had no other option. And one of the things that... Uh, I look at now that we can get into of what would you have told your your younger self, but in looking at that going, when you get out of college, there's so much of, okay, now what? Now go. And so went to L.A. because that's all I knew was my dad was in L.A., not that I was going out to be an actor or to be in the entertainment industry. I just wanted to go out there. So uh, went out, uh, had a place, ended up following a friend to an audition, dropping him off, and the casting director said, do you want to come read for this role? This was the, f the beginning of it. And so <clears throat> read for a role that was maybe two lines. And they go, okay. Then uh, they called me back in another couple of days. Read for this role is a little bit bigger. Same thing over and over again. Can you come back in? We just want you to read. And I'm like, I've never been in class. I don't know. I'm just reading this stuff. So then as it got on after about two weeks, they said, okay, read this. And they came out and they said, uh, we want you to be the lead in this. And I called my dad and I go, this is really tough. I don't know if I can do it. And he goes, you know, it, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of this, a lot of that. And I go, no, no, it's not rejection. Like, they want me to do this. I can't do this. How do I do this? And he goes, just do it. Huh. And from that... What was your dad's first name? Mike. Oh, Mike uh, Kennedy. TJ uh, Mike. Okay. He did a lot of Oliver Stone films. Uh, he was on Dallas. He uh, was the voice of Bluebell Ice Cream for a long time. Really? And he's got this scraggly voice. He had a scene in, in JFK where he plays, uh, I think, the, uh, Gene Hill's interrogator or the CIA, head of the CIA, and he's yelling this, the, that's impossible, you heard echoes, echoes. Because she goes, I heard three shots back at the book depository. And he wow. had this mean look, and people would go, God, he's such a great actor. I go, that was childhood. Oh, wow. Seeing that face, seeing him talk to you like that. You don't watch JFK. It's so I have to PTSD. remind my kids when they see me in the way that my vernacular comes out in the tonality, I go, I'm not mad. That's just the way I talk. Passion. When you go, you know, exactly. And if you tear up in the middle of watching a mayonnaise commercial, my kids will look at me. I go, <laughs> it's just the way that I'm built where you kind of see things different. I built my way up doing some television, some episodic. Well, no, scene. you got the lead in the show. Hold on. You got, got to finish the story with your dad. So you call your dad. And he didn't realize it. And I told him the nice story was that, no, I wasn't rejected. They wanted to offer me the lead. And at that point, I didn't have, an, I didn't have anything. I didn't have agents or attorneys or anybody and stuff. And all I knew is that I wanted to get uh, ice, uh, haagen and vanilla bean ice cream. That was my negotiating tactic. I wanted to get that, and then I wanted whatever my trailer accommodation was, because I knew that for my dad was I wanted longer, bigger. And so they didn't even have trailers. It was a low-budget little fun thing. And so I'm doing it, and they brought me a bag of ice cream, and I thought I'd made it. I thought this it. is great. Free ice cream. So that catapulted you into a different world. And as, as someone else that went, lived in L.A., I never got offered the lead in anything. Uh, L.A., if you're watching or listening, uh, I'm still angry. But... You know, that obviously will put you on a different stage and in front of people that maybe, you know, we're from Texas and we're SMU people and we, we don't understand Hollywood. But was it a weird reality being thrown into this immediately and having access to things, but also realizing that, oh, my gosh, this is not what I actually thought it was going to be like? It is because then you, you try to realize real quick why people are coming at you, because it's not really for you, because being born and raised in the Bible Belt and in the faith, you'd want to treat other people as you're treated. 
and then when other people are treating you a certain nice way when they don't even know you, uh, you have to be prepared for it because everybody wants something mm. in going through it. And it, it's an interesting kind of self-teach, and you see a lot of people burn out really quickly that are amazing talents, and then they get out into it, and you know they're, they're abused by the whole thing. And did you feel yourself kind of selling out a little bit and getting sucked in, or were you able to stay grounded the whole time? Well, you find yourself fitting into the veins that are available to you. So at that point, uh, Aaron Spelling was really doing amazing things. Nine hundred two SMU guy. Uh, yeah, was he really? Yeah. Is he a cheerleader? I don't know, but I know he's oh, SMU wow. guy. Yeah. So Aaron Spelling was his shows were really starting to take off, and that's where all people that were early twenties wanted to try to get into. And so I started getting into his rotation and doing, I was on Melrose Place, which is a, a, a story about how I got into the club business and then did uh, Pacific Palisades, some 902, all these shows that kind of went together. And then what I realized- Which means you had the look. I had the look. You had the look. You had the look. You had just turned into your dad for a second. I had the look. <laughs> yeah, it's like mayonnaise commercial. Anyway, so you so you, you knew you had something and you were leveraging these You knew I had it and then you have to become that product that they're looking for, which is kind of interesting because there's a lot of people that don't succumb to that and turn into what everybody else wants. Like Chris Pratt used to be, you know, very kind of hefty, overweight guy that had an incredible sense of humor and he morphed. The Rock always knew that his type was going to go out there and he was very focused. Uh, and what I realized by no matter how much work you get consistently or not, that the moment you finish, you're still unemployed, just like everybody else. So as an athlete, if you practice all week, you're preparing to play. And as an actor, when you go and you practice, you go to class, you do everything, then you get a job, then you play. Uh, there's not another game right after that in the acting world. You have to go out and fight again to do it. And so as a performance-based thing of I, I'm doing it so that I can continue to move up unless you're one of the ones like on a Brad Pitt when he started on Dallas he was just that guy that kept going but said okay let's look up here so some of it it's it's odd it happens for some it won't for others but a lot of it is how you sell yourself and your self-promotion and how you package yourself by the way this is a couple decades before social media and so this is like true grind mode. True grind. You know, you're, you're talking uh, mid-90s where, you know, internet was still a, a new thing. And so you had to embrace this to a whole new level. And what, I mean, what did that look like? What was the, what was the, the only, strategy? They had a magazine there uh, backstage and in the back of it. Backstage they would have West. That's it. Dude, I know it. And Dramalog. Yep. And they would have the castings back there. And then if you're, you don't know anybody, you're new to town. Uh, you might follow people to different auditions and stuff, but you would just get your little 8x10 headshot, find the address, and send out all day long. Dude, I, had a, I was a machine with Hundreds it. of it, right? Yeah. You and get your, one phone call. You're your like, attrition, your what? ROA, maybe one out of yeah. 100 or 1,000, and you keep trying to do this, and so you have to figure out a creative way. Remember Dennis Woodruff, uh -uh. the guy that drove the car? that he decked out, and he was very famous. He was kind of like the guy version of Angeline, where they never really did anything. The Kissing Bandit? Is that who Angeline was? No. She was the pink Corvette. Oh, pink Corvette. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They just had a movie or a TV show yeah. coming out about her. Yeah, okay. With Emmy, Emmy Rossum. Yeah, right. So the Dennis Woodruff was a self-promoter, but he didn't have anything to follow up with. So he would drive his car around, and everybody knew him, and he would be an extra in some shows, but they knew this car. He would glue statues on it everywhere. He would put streamers. It was just an – you'd see it. A spectacle. Yeah, just absolutely crazy. A talentless spectacle. Yeah. Pre-Kardashian. So, very pre. I, I mean, the Kardashians, I remember, and again, incredible brand, incredible family, but they're famous for being famous, right? There's not – and their skills have actually evolved, but – so you, you were saying something, too, about how you got on Melrose Place and that led you to doing the Vegas thing. So let, let, let's talk about that story because it's pretty fascinating because that kind of was that kind of was a pivotal moment in your life and your yeah. career. And you helped spearhead an entire industry that no one had ever heard of with reality television. So what was the Melrose Place to Vegas to aha moment? How did that thing all go down? I was uh, I ran the bar on the show in the bar uh, on Melrose Place. And so whenever everybody would come in, I'd be the one interacting. So ran the bar on the show. Not ran a real bar. You literally were a bartender on the show. I, I was, yeah. Or was you ran the, the bar show. on the show. And it was a fake set. It wasn't a real bar. It, was, yeah, it wasn't real not, booze. You weren't like doing it behind the scenes yeah. when they were on a break. I'd not yeah. been a bartender. I'd not been, a, uh, worked at a club. I'd been at a club. And uh, I ended up with uh, Chateau Marmont, working at Bar Marmont with Andre Balas. And that uh, I ended up going out to the Hamptons. And a guy that owned 
conscious point, he came and heard about me through some other people and said, hey, I understand that uh, you've run a bar before. And I go, yeah, just kind of waiting to see where he goes. And he goes, I want you to come and manage. Wait, so literally the bar was on Melrose Place without real alcohol. On the TV show, That's on the TV I'm set. Saying, but I'm saying yeah. it wasn't. You but ran real. a bar. It's so, like how Joey Turbiana played a doctor on TV. It's the exact same thing. Gotcha. So I get out there and he he wants he hires me to run his bar, thinking that I know how to do it because I did it on TV. <laughs> I'm like, this is great. So you moved I can to Vegas. This. No, I, I oh, was. This was. Or this is in the Hamptons. This, this is in the Hamptons. So I'm out in the Hamptons, and now I am uh, working at this nightclub where every celebrity in the world, everybody was going out to the Hamptons, and I didn't know operations how to do it, but I knew people. And I knew basically you can talk to anybody, and it's always kind of qualifying them and talk about them. Where are you from was always my thing because anybody had an accent. And that turned into that guy was opening the club in Las Vegas. So 9-11 happens. Nobody knew what was going on. And we get out to Vegas and start building out Light Nightclub, which was going to be at, which was at the Bellagio. It was going to be a tram between Caesars. Was was the Vegas nightlife scene really a scene back then? Nothing. There was nothing yeah. going on, and nobody had bottles. Uh, Siegfried and Roy were still going. The kids' world at MGM was still happening, where it was kind of a family oriented thing. And Vegas is very cyclical, so about every seven so years, you it changes. ruined Vegas. I did. Yeah, it was all me. Yeah, and then made it worse once. Yeah, Gigolos yeah. came out. Yeah. Well, so, oh, don't don't spoil it yeah. yet. But yeah, but I mean, think. But Vegas, people don't realize this. Pre, I mean, when Vegas first came up, it was Frank. It was the Rat Pack and entertaining, and it was relatively, you know, it was mafia innocent. And then my family went on spring break there when I was a sophomore in high school, uh, and it was just, it was fun. We saw Siegfried and Roy. We saw Wayne Newton. We saw Copperfield, and then all of a sudden, here comes Marklin. Yeah, and this was on the dawn of a whole new. Uh, you know, a whole new business to leverage people that would spend their money on things that, you know, eventually their turn would become $30,000 millionaires. But you were on the precipice of it. And we got in. Openly. All because he was a bartender on Melrose yes, Place. Yes, all because I was a fake bartender on Melrose Place. But anyway, so so get us there. So you, you go to Vegas. You go to Vegas. We, we get the space. It was a 7,500-square-foot rectangle. We put 38 tables in there that me and – there were only five of us uh, – that were in the original crew, and me and three of them drove giant U-Haul trucks to, uh, where did we go to? Not to Compton, but it was close to it. It was in the middle of a Farrakhan rally because we had to pick up all the furniture. Oh my gosh. And I remember them coming in and going, it's getting dark soon, you need to leave. And they go, but we still have a lot of stuff. And they go, no, you need to go. So we got in, the, in these giant U-Haul trucks. You didn't even need a CDL. We're just driving the equipment, all of the furniture back. Drove it all back to Bellagio and hand every single piece. We hung inside of this club. We put drapes, we put mirrors, we put lights. Did you think you were crazy when you were doing this? Wondering if it was just know. a fun experience. But it I'm was, it's not like field of dreams. You're just like, all right, this could actually be awesome oh, or it could be a big boss. We had no idea. We we knew on paper what our plan was was to have a DJ, have tables, and then people were gonna come in and sit down, have a cocktail waitress, have a bus or a security guard and stuff and that they were going to order actual physical bottles of, of liquor. Which was unheard of. And in theory, it sounded good. But then when we get there, and now I'm going to go give presentations to all of the casinos with all of the departments from international, domestic, all from bellhop, valet to housekeeping. I mean, I covered everybody, even in the, uh, the restaurants where the employees eat that you're, you're getting in there and telling them, it's like, here's what you're going to do, would walk them through it. And it was crickets. People would just tell you, that is not going to work. People will not go sit down. Because the casino at that time was about 70-30, with 70 being gambling and 30 being the, your, your, your hospitality. Mm. So on the gambling aspect, they didn't want people gone from the tables and for more than booze an hour. Booze yeah, and they're giving yeah. the free well booze. Yeah. And so tried to get the casinos on board and then going back to my parents in the car business that I went down Sahara Boulevard in Vegas and that's where all the car dealerships were and I went in and asked for the GSM and I go look my family's in the car business I'm sure everybody in here is an alcoholic and I'm opening this club and I'm sure you like to drink I mean my my approach wasn't there yet I just went for the kill really soon I was like you're an alcoholic right it was just my parents are too i'm marklin yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm marklin see my name and yeah. when i have kids in, in 10 years i'm gonna name them this and so i went what i knew was going up and down sahara talking to car dealers and i said let me invite you in we'll get you a bottle and do this and now you're a sale guy to a sale guy and they're going what's what's the catch what's yeah. in it 
It even went so far that it went by TGI Fridays, and they had a big fishbowl where you put your business card in for a free lunch. I'd go up there, and I'd wait until nobody was looking, and I'd take all the business cards. <laughs> I, would, I would take the business cards wow. and then go back and cold call them for a nightclub. Wow. At the Bellagio, I would cold call them and go, hey, we're, uh, no, I don't want to buy solar, but we are getting ready to open up the nightclub, and I'd like to invite you in. This is back before efficiency really was a, a thing. And if you, I was talking to somebody this morning about the yellow pages back in the day, right? This was this was phone book era, right? I mean, obviously, the Internet had came, come up and cell phones were there, but there wasn't a way to go and really Google someone's info. There wasn't a way to send a mass email. There wasn't a way to go and do this from a machine gun approach. So this was really you one-off hustling, trying to get people yeah. in there, selling a concept that was unheard of. People probably thought you were a berserk, but it worked. We didn't even have a lot of prices for the bottles. We knew that a Grey Goose or a Belvedere was going to be 275 285 going into it. But when it got to a large format, we had a guy come in, and he wanted Louis Trey. We didn't have it, but we were on the buying power of the casino. So we would be able to, to access anything they had. Well, Prime was a restaurant downstairs. and they Steakhouse. Had, Prime Steakhouse. I remember. They had a bottle of Louis Trey. This guy wanted it. So I go over to Prime. I go, can I swap you, do a bill back? Let me get that. What's your cost on it? And he goes, 2500 So I get it and come up, give it to the guy. And there's the server standing next to me waiting. She goes, what do we charge for this? And I go, um, and then just start looking around. What could a value be of this thing? And then I just made up a price at 13000 and it became the standard. He paid thirteen grand. Thirteen grand for that. Now, what is Louis Trey? Like, it's, it's a bottle of liquor. It, it, it's a bottle of liquor. It's uh, something. I'm glad I don't know. Yeah, if you were gonna be a sipper of a cognac, gotcha. or a brandy, or something into there, it's it's strong. If you're gonna drink it, you're a committed drinker. Like Hennessy's a committed drink. Okay. Like it's strong. You you fulfill it. It's like smoking a cigar. And so that thirteen thousand went down. Now that price is. From thirteen, there it could be thirty-eight thousand. So the bottles have. You're dumped. saying right now in twenty twenty two. Right now in twenty twenty two, somebody will spend thirty-eight thousand. It depends on that place. It couldn't be more than that. They have bottles that are over a hundred. Shut up. Then you get into formats. So you have your regular seven fifties. Then when you get into your Jerobombs, which is so many liters, champagne was the big thing, and then your Methuselah, which is very large, and then an Ebenezer. These bottles go up and up and up. So our volume price on a bottle of Dom was probably $112, but we were selling it for $800, $900. And you just kind of wait to see the reaction. And now that same bottle, it's probably $2,500, $3,000 for these things coming in. But what we found is that people are willing to pay for it depending on the experience that's delivered. And coming from a an entertainment background and being around production and <clears throat> looking at a fake bar on Melrose Place, but it looked real because of the what they put around it, the production aspect of it. So when we would have people come in and sit at a table, if they just sat there and drank the same bottle of uh, vodka they're going to drink at any other club, restaurant, or bar in the town and hear the same music and, and basically spend the same amount of time, if we didn't give them, to take, give them something to take away with them, then there was no experience value to it. Hmm. So we started adding things into it and it became either an entertainer was coming up. So you just kind of figured it out. Because in the beginning, our DJs, we were maybe paying them 150 a night, 250 a night. $250. Now there's $250. Yeah. Now some of these guys are making $80 million, $20 million contracts that a lot of the casino, the, these nights press are a doing. button. Press a button for the same basic vodka that's inside. But they know that they're going to lead to more people in the casino. I mean, it's a good investment. It went, everybody wins. <clears throat> And the 70-30 aspect of the hospitality and gaming slowly started to switch because we were capturing the market so much and had the ability over the, gamer, the, the gambler where instead of the casino bringing them in and saying, sit at our table, we're going to give you a comp buffet, we could say, oh, we have Leonardo coming in this weekend. Do you want to sit over here? Or do you want to do this? Because every celebrity, every politician, all of the, the people that were always in the news were always at the club, and they would always come in because light ended up being one of the number one hotspots in the entire country. Was it exhausting? It wasn't because it was so much fun, and I had such a passion for it. It's not like you were putting in 12-hour days every single day. It's you're consistently building up and developing your database and staying in touch and having a follow-up 
And then this led to, again, the, 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 the pi- you pioneered, you know, you pioneered an, in, an industry that is now everywhere. You can't go to freaking any town in the world without knowing what bottle service is. And, and it's a different kind of entertainment. But as a business person, as an entrepreneur, as an educated guy, tell us about how you were on the dawning of reality TV with the show that you created. I remember in the... Ham- because of being in Vegas, right? Because or, of being in yeah. Vegas. I remember being in the Hamptons in the beginning when... Uh, survivor was on and i think it was its first season and watching it going this is fantastic what they're doing with television because amazing race had been on but nobody really watched it at that point because it mainstream like you had your diehards on it and survivor came out and started to become a big thing so i get into vegas and i'm running light and people would come up that were in the industry and they go you know this reality stuff's a big deal we want to do a reality show on you and didn't really understand what that meant. Were you, were you married at the time? Single? Was not married, but I'm doing all these things. But the number one thing then I always had to do for any of my projects out of Vegas is you have to make sure that you you, you show Vegas its respect, that uh, the same in casinos. I couldn't do a reality show based on me because then it pulls the curtain back on the casino or the gambler. So to keep the anonymity of all of the, the inner workings that were going on, and the reason that I... I believe I kept up with my relationships uh, that were always in the club was that you never aired their dirty laundry. They knew they could come in and nobody knew what was going on again before social media. Now you either have some of the, some of the nightclubs will have blockers so that they can stop the signal going on so that people don't take a picture of so-and-so with so-and-so. No way. So they're trying to do some of that in there because one picture now can ruin people. And with all of the, 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 you know, the climate of, of the country that has been going on the last several years. Yeah. People are really anxious and looking for things, how they can take other people down. So protecting the anonymity was such a big thing and not uh, exposing the casino. I did I couldn't or didn't want to do a reality show on me at that time. It's like, what would it be? Yeah. Just standing out, waving at people. But. But I had an agent friend and that I had met out in the Hamptons. And this all started because a... Uh, a a f- very famous girl was coming in for her bachelorette party, and she came out. Normally in Vegas, you get asked for everything, and it's usually you know somebody. If somebody needs a three-legged ant eater that likes peanut butter, no matter what it is, like I know a guy, you want to go helicoptering, <laughs> drop in the Grand Canyon, do a backflip, and uh, where are the strip clubs? Where's the best restaurant? And this girl came in and said, hey, are there any guys in here? And I go, yeah, it's like thousands of them up there. <laughs> There's guys everywhere. And she was like, no, no, like, are there guys that, see, we're on a bachelorette party, and I'm looking for a guy. I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. And it was a lot of the same thing about, I I don't know where you're going, just spit (laughs) it out. She was like, look, I'm getting ready to get married. Kind of want to find something to get it out of my system before then. I'm like, oh, Uh all right, there's this guy up in the club that where Versace is belly buttoned. The shirt would be unbuttoned all the way. And I go up, and his name was Rico. And I'm like, hey, uh, this girl's asking me. Like, are there guys, guys that would spend time with women and all these things? And he goes, my friend, that's what they do. I'm gigolo. I'm gigolo. I take care of her. And I go, did not know that. Well, this is, I, this was not an idea. I couldn't major in this at SMU. Yeah. I, yeah, enlighten me. They didn't have gig- gigolo economics yeah. at SMU. And so I bring her up, her and her group, introduce them to there. She shows up at the club an hour or so later after they'd left and had a smile on her face. And I'm like... Wow, this is interesting. You just because broke normally a really the, weird deal. Normally at the casinos, you know, at a circle bar or something out there, you kind of know you have some workers. It's been kind of documented. They're women of the night that are in, in, in all the casinos. But guys like to work too. Guys like to work too. Yeah. It's just fair. And so I called my friend that was an agent that I'd met out in the Hamptons, and I go, I have an idea for a TV show. It's about women paying men for a company experience experience yeah an experience for the boyfriend broker. experience yeah and it's the james bond knows how to woo women they speak the languages he goes it's the worst idea that i've heard not today not this month but forever he goes just stick to what you're doing he goes let me do my tv stuff I go, okay great so then it keeps going i keep bugging him on it and <clears throat> he goes all right let me set up some meetings so he sets up with a couple of different production companies meet all them and i'm telling them the same stories and then we end up going to Showtime. The agent sets it up. And I get in, the sh- in sh- at Showtime in a big office. It's about 12 to 15 people. And they're just staring at me. They have little blank 
pads in front of them with a pencil and they're taking notes. And I start telling stories about things I'd done or you'd done or people I knew or whatever it was, but attributed it to there's this group of guys in Vegas that do this. At one point, I'm painting the picture that the jigs are sitting there playing blackjack and painting the picture in the description that the ace of clubs is up and pretty soon it's getting ready to come over and now you have the jack of hearts and as it hits and for some reason I start singing Chaka Khan's Tell Me Something Good in the room and I'm just doing it and they are staring at me after it's over had you had coffee? I had not had coffee then oh I think I was trying to figure because I didn't know what was going on in there, which was great because it was naivete of not being preparing myself too much of, oh, my God, this is going to be crazy. And so left, thought, you're right, I'm just going to go back to Vegas and continue what I was doing. I don't understand this business. Two weeks later, the agent calls and goes, well, Showtime is interested and they liked it. We, they want you to send over your Bible. And I go, why would they want a Bible? What in the Bible could actually help them make a TV show about gigolos? And they go, no, no, a Bible mm. is all of your guys, like your deck. Sweet, innocent Texans. Yeah. Here we go, strike two. Yeah. So I tell him on the phone after he tells me this great news about sending over the Bible on the deck and about the gigolos, and I go, oh, I've never met any that were really doing it. It was just a story. Picks up that phone, not happy, because you just sold a show to Showtime. You better find some gigolos. So... Barbecue was maybe a month old, two months old. <laughs> Carrie's feeding barbecue at 2.30 in the morning. I'm on the computer in the office. The screen's facing the door. Oh. It's middle of the night. I'm Googling gigolos or male escorts, which if that's your thing, that's great. Wouldn't recommend doing it whenever you've got a newborn at home <laughs> and your wife walks by and goes, What's going Some, on? Something you could have told me earlier. Yeah, this, this is how I find out. I go, I've got to find gigolos. And she just shook her head and turned walked away she was like of course you do oh. so the hook was that they were straight male escorts and this was their service that they did and so cowboys for angels contacted garen <clears throat> and took a long time for him to understand that this was not some kind of fetish where i wanted to get a bunch of guys and then film them it was no we want to do a tv show i need to get you some tape on these guys instead of showtime all of that goes through showtime makes the show it airs a little bit more graphic than what my pitch was. My pitch was James Bond and everybody's happy and they know stuff. First episode, Nick, all the tattoos, in the shower, turns around, full frontal. I look at Karen, I go, we have to move. We, we're going to have to move. They're going to run me out of this town. Showtime put, didn't put a dollar into it of marketing or anything else. Show starts to go. <clears throat> we made seven seasons out of the thing. And I started using my contacts and database and everything. How do I market this show? I know how to market that. While a believer, a husband, a father, staying grounded, but you figured it out. Yep. And did all that. And? Well, well, you can't just end it there with the full frontal. This is not <laughs> Boogie Nights. I didn't know if this was our button. And it was like, no, okay, no, no. But this is next the, the, again, another, another pivot, though. I mean, Dallas, LA, yep. Hamptons, Vegas. In Vegas, you go and you, you know, are a icon in the nightclub industry and you parlay that into a reality television career which again this is on the the forefront of reality tv yeah. being a thing that when i lived in la I tried to do the acting thing reality tv was frowned upon because it was taking away opportunity from actors yeah and then the business people were like oh my god i don't have to pay these people i can make a lot of money it's cheap and easy tv let's rock and roll so you decide at what point to go and move away from vegas because it wasn't a place you wanted to you know, continue to build your brand or however you want to, you know, explain it. The the television aspect when Jigs went and then I realized that the transitory aspect of, of people living there but not from there. So I created a bunch of different shows based around there. And realizing that that storytelling turns into anything you're doing and on a selling aspect, that's basically all it was because I would come up with an idea, create it, and then try to layer it out and figure out how do I execute it. So from the gigolos and then late night chef fight, Vivica's Black Magic. Wait, what was the late night? Late what? night chef fight was a show about chefs. Whenever they get out of their thirty million dollar kitchens at the casinos, they were going to a bar called Tommy Rockers uh, across the street from the Bellagio, and they would get in there at three o'clock in the morning. Everybody's having fun, getting liquored because they're not around their their job, <clears throat> and there were food trucks outside that organically these chefs and cooks and people were going out there, I'm a better cook than you. And so they would go out, and whatever was in the truck at that moment, you had to try to create a dish. So two people would go out, they'd make a dish, and then give it to 
all the drunk people at the bar, and then they would decide who was the best chef for that night. And they had a small trophy that ended up being really huge because each week they would do something. And I drove by and saw this energy going one night and went in there, and I go, this is a show. <laughs> this is really like interesting. drunk Bobby Flay. Yeah, that's um, a good one. So, you, so you, you keep doing this. You said Vivica, Vivica's Black Magic. Vivica Fox had a show, Vivica's Black Magic, which was kind of like Magic Mike, that she was putting together a male dance review and they were coming into Vegas and they didn't know how to execute it and do stuff. Howard Owens, who is an SMU grad, owns a company out there and he was producing this and he called and said, hey, we need some help out in Vegas. And I said, I can direct you to people, but why don't I just be on it? Because I'm going to tell whoever you need told the same exact thing that I'll say to her. And then it ended up this really fun, got them over to the plaza. Uh, they did amazing stuff for it. It was a great show. Is it even fair for me to ask what the most exciting project you've worked on was up to that point or has been? I did a show on the Clark County Coroner, which is the medical, medical examiner. It's Clark County, Vegas? Yes, okay. Clark County's in Vegas. And I always have to say medical examiner because with my accent, people would always say, why would you do a show on a coroner? Not oh, a corner, a cor I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I heard coroner, yeah. And that was probably the most fascinating because I love the science aspect of it and getting in, figuring out. And th what they do is the moment that something somebody dies, then we'd get the call and go start to, you know, taking care of it on a coroner level. And then you solve it, solve the crime, figure it out if there is one, if not. Uh, and we did that for, it took a long time to get clearance because we had to go through the entire state, then the board, then everybody within Nevada, and then have them know that respectfully, <laughs> again, respecting Vegas, that we're not looking to do anything bad and try to find Jimmy Hoffa or was Tupac really killed, all this. We want to focus on the people, but the stories of the inner workings of the medical examiner's office. And it was absolutely fascinating seeing, especially... Some of the cases that came through were there, somebody's found in a tree and they drowned in the middle of the desert. What happened to them? How'd they die? So you go through, Vegas is synonymous with flash floods. It's not built on a grade level. So when water hits up at Charleston, it's going to come down. Or whenever it rains there, God just drops a bucket of rain. And there's video you can see. There's just 100,000 gallons hit all at once. And then it disappears. So guys out walking. Flash flood comes and grabs him, drowns, gets thrown into a tree. That's all you see. And there's also this thing called dry drowning that would happen, where a flash flood comes through, get water into your lungs. You don't die at that moment, but maybe an hour later. And so trying those little things that weren't just your normal deaths were going out. One, and this was on CSI, a guy with a, was out hiking in uh, Red Rock, and he was bald. And his skull was cracked, and they needed to figure out how he died. And all they knew is that there was a dead turtle next to him. Uh, and so and their hawks come by and had picked up the turtle. And they take the hawk way up, the turtle way up in the air and drop it. You're joking. They need to find something shiny. So the bald head had sweat and was bouncing off the sun. <laughs> so the hawk would drop the turtle. It, would, it landed on the guy's head. Kills him, but he's out in the middle of nowhere. Now you're trying to figure out how did this guy die? I, I, yeah. I mean, this could we could sit here for for five hours, but I want to make sure that we we, we are respectful of yeah. time. I, um, I want to make mention of the fact that one of the reasons I brought you on here is that you're a, a centered uh, man and you're a family man and, and you your faith is uh, the focus of your life, and I love that. How did you maintain that whenever? I mean, you're thrown into the freaking jungle here, man. Yeah. And you're putting yourself in the jungle. What What was your headspace for staying humble, grounded, knowing where you came from? Where you know you're living in Vegas. That's a That's a difficult thing. You're in the nightclub industry. That's a difficult thing. <laughs> Reality TV. That's hard. About gigolos. And, and you have access to all these different people. But what was your headspace like to know that you had to maintain true to the person that you were before you had all the access to just temptation? What, what, what was that like? How did you ha how did you have to train yourself to stay, you know, Marklin and yeah. not get a, be a punk? It's really listening to that voice that you were raised with, that your parents instilled, uh, taking you to church or, you know, praying at, at dinner, going to Christmas service and all of the traditions that are faith-based. And, and looking around Vegas, I was looking at the fact that people will spend two and a half days there at most, that they would go in to vacation. 
tourists would come in and spend more on things like bottle service, clubs, restaurants, things that they're just going to expel from their body. Spend more on that than they would on a mattress they're going to spend a third of their life sleeping on. And that it really seemed like God was a little vapid, not that he didn't exist in Las Vegas, just that it was very tough for people to get away from their normal life because they wanted to escape because Vegas isn't real. There's, the walls aren't real. The money's not real. It's chips. So, and that's all on purpose. And trying to make any of it reality of the moment is the fact, is what's tough because everybody wants to go to heaven, just not yet. Mm -hmm. And when they're getting out to Vegas, they go, I'm all good, but today... I'm going to kind of take a break. One of the shows I actually did was called Sin City, and we brought in a group of evangelical Christians because I grew up here in the Bible Belt of how we could bring them into Vegas and kind of tempt their faith. We put them into positions of working at <laughs> nightclubs. I don't know. It's true. And? And uh, we put them, they were to work at strip clubs, at nightclubs, all these things. It's we, like Hunger Games for Christians. Yes. That wow. Is one, that's much better than, it's kind of like the Amish show. <laughs> I should have had your tagline. Hunger Games for Christians. Oh, my God. They'd go, have you seen the Amish show? Well, it's not like that. Um, another interesting question that I don't even feel like it's fair to ask. What would you, I mean, you're the kind of guy, I, I feel like we're similar to, if you want to try something, you're going to figure out a way to try it. What would you have even, would you have told your younger self anything different? The only, and it's not even a regret, the only thing that I look at is that I would have much, I really would have loved to have known about business early. I would, have, yeah. I would have focused and majored in business. I would have had a foundation coming out on the launch from high school. Yep. And being a football player, there's a thing that always happened that, okay, it's great you're playing. And the moment that you graduate, it's kind of, hey, we've got other guys to worry yep. about playing next year. Your product. And the, if NIL existed back then, it would have been great. But one thing I think is so important now is the financial literacy to explain to people what they do with the money they're getting. But... If I would go back in time, explain, you need to start working and putting together a plan now. Yeah. Not, hey, let's see what happens. I love the challenge. I love to see what's ever out there and stuff. But that's what I would do. Same. I would focus on business. Same. Um, I had to mature into understanding what business even was. What's the best advice you have received and the best advice you would give somebody, whether it's your children, it's your family, it's your friends? Uh, you're, you're a very accomplished guy, and you're still very young. And these things that you've done... I mean, it's it's like Willy Wonka meets Walt Disney meets oh, Steve Wen. I love it. <laughs> um, but for real, I mean, it's it's and like you see these things, which I think it's hard for people like you and me to sleep. Where yeah. you have, you know, you get it, but if you try to explain to somebody, you're like, what? Like, wh wh how much coffee have you had? It's like, no, this is what's inside my head, and it's going to happen. Blah 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 blah. And I want to connect the dots, right? What's the advice? That, what 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 advice have you received, and what advice would you give to somebody that maybe has an ounce of your potential? Yeah. Looking at it just from a, a, a layman term, if, don't be afraid. If you have obstacles in front of you, figure out how you either go around them, go under them, go through them. But one thing that I always believed and went by was the only reason, because I didn't know anything about television. I didn't know anything about producing a show, creating a show, but I had just written things down. And the only reason I, I always looked at it that made me think I could do it was because I never thought that I couldn't. Nothing ever got into my head and said, you know, you're not going to do well at this or, you know, you know nothing about this. I'd get into situations and go, I've got the confidence in the fact that I can listen, absorb, process it and try to put it out. And it all came back from when I was a kid being around the car business of not the if I could, would you sales, but how you qualify people and figure out their needs versus your needs and wants. And I think that's really what it was, is figuring out what does, what can I do to produce something that that person wants? Because I'm trying to sell something that nobody else wants, just me. It's not going to be a very good product. Some shows, I'd put together a bunch of them. It takes 100 pitches just trying to get one. So uh, you and I are the same way that, you know, at 3 o'clock midnight, if I'm still awake, I'm, I'm writing. I'm, create, I'm trying to figure something out. And some of the shows, you show it to somebody, yeah, that's not, that's not going to be good. Or that's interesting. Yeah. But I wow. think you need a litmus. You need somebody to bounce off of things, too. Mm -hmm. Which is hard when you're... The one celebrity I always wanted to meet was Robin Williams. Oh. And I never met him. And I would just hear... I'm like, I get you. Or even like a Jim Carrey. Like these people that are, you know, they're, they're zany. But, you know, I think there's some brilliance in there. And I think that, you know, you've got a, a more leveled and uh, balanced version of that. All right. Well, the, the final question... Um, 
obviously we're going to be able to find you really easily. How, how do we support you? Where do we find you? And I know that you do everything from SMU football to in your face productions. One of my musical heroes, Billy Gibbons. That's when I met you ZZ top, you know, good old boy from Texas. I know that you help manage his career and it's just another mark. Oh, of course, of course, Mark Lynn helps manages Billy Gibbons of ZZ tops, but how do we support you and how do we find you? I am all over social media. I'll be the the Facebook, which is a lot of you know the Facebook, Facebook. the Facebook, a lot of the real. Isn't that what they called it in the beginning? Yeah, the yeah, Facebook, the yeah. Facebook, and then the Instagram. Is this uh, on the internet? internet? On the internet. Okay. It's usually it's a download speed. It's the slow dial up. Yes. Uh, mostly on that uh, YouTube. Have a big YouTube channel. Do a lot of stuff. Billy's always on there. Billy's been a friend for over thirty years. Uh, don't manage him. I've been such good friends with him, and then he is Queso's godfather. But Billy is the guy that Rogers got to spend time with him on the uh, field at SMU. Billy had come out and done the coin toss yeah. for Tulane. And the three minds, because Billy, is, he remembers everything he's ever done, anybody he's ever mm. met. And if you talk to him about music, that's cool. He loves it. If you talk to him about uh, a fact that had to do with Eli Whitney and the cotton gin or something, uh, he just loves it. Mm. So all three of us can have these conversations. He'll be out uh, coming in for the 24th. Oh, He'll cool. be playing at Dos Equis Pavilion, and I'm pretty sure he's going to come by the TCU game so we can oh, fun. make sure we fry those frogs. and Cool. All I those things it. there. So we need to give you. Oh. Oh, no way. The ZZ keychain. How about that? That's that's a real, that's, yeah. Thank from, you. From the Eliminator. I was going to call you. him, you can say hello, but oh he gets out here. Wow. Well, um, awesome. We're ending this on a high note, and uh, thanks for being a, a great friend and a, like you, you have so much incredible energy and you're such an executioner, which a lot of people have ideas and you're an idea guy that actually accomplishes it. So thanks for being a part of the show and for sharing your stories and for staying grounded and for just for being you. So Marklin, thanks for being a part. Rogers, thank you so much. Yeah. Have a great week. You too.